and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. We all have favorites, and we all have least favorites when it comes to lots of things in life. If I said to you, what's your favorite food? I mean, if you could pick any food to eat right now or in any moment of life, you'd be like, my favorite food is, and you could, you could close your eyes in your mind, imagine it. I'm doing that right now. I'm seeing this beautiful burrito, <laughs> chili verde, green sauce. And, and, and next to it, a bowl of really hot, like, habanero sauce to put over the top and, and even to put on every single... My mouth starts to water when I think about it. It seriously does. When I think about the foods I love, I, it's amazing. And, and then if you said to me, hey, I, I've got something for you, a little snack for you to eat on, it's broccoli and cauliflower. <laughs> See, not so much. I'm sorry for our egg people. But, you know, that, that's not... You know, I've got favorites and then things that, that are, are not as favorite. If I said to you... What's your favorite thing to do when you have free time? And you say, what's free time? But you say, well, if you just imagine you had like a whole day or a whole week off. Some people would say this. They'd say, oh, I would just want to sit on a, on a beach chair, like at a lake or in the hills or on the ocean, just to sit and do absolutely nothing. That's my least favorite thing. I go crazy. I would go, like, after, after like 30 seconds, I'm like, okay, let's do something. If I'm by the ocean, I want to be in the water. I want to, I want to snowboard. I want to golf. I want to do something active. That's my favorite is, so our favorites aren't always the same, but when it comes actually to the Bible and the kind of topics that are in the Bible and taught by Jesus, I find that most people have kind of the same favorite and the same least favorite. And, and for many, and, and what I'm going to do today in my sermon is I'm going to talk about both of those. I'm going to talk about what I think are, are many people's favorite thing in the Bible, and I'm going to talk about what are many people's least favorite thing in the Bible, and that is that we're talking about Heaven and hell. You take a guess which one's probably most people's favorite topic. Um, the Bible talks about eternity. And that every single human being has an eternity in front of them. And, and the Bible addresses this issue that, that, that we all have an eternal condition. So here's my question. What does the Bible say about eternity? And Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, I want you to listen to these words. If you have your own Bible, you can underline what kind of jumps out at you. But Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, listen to these words, made us alive with Christ. But here's the key. Even when we were dead in transgressions. There's both life and death there. It is by grace you have been saved. And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What the Bible teaches us is that every human being is already um, spiritually dead. There's an infection in our souls. It's almost like finding out that you have spiritual cancer. I mean, it's, it, when you find out what the Bible says, the Bible has this word called sin. And sin is... Any thought that you think that you shouldn't think. Have you ever th thought a thought, just yes or no, out loud, have you ever thought a thought that you shouldn't have thought? Okay, if, if you haven't, oh please. Um, <laughs> yeah. have, you ever, have you ever done something you shouldn't have done? Yes or no? All of us have had. Have you ever said something you shouldn't have said? Did you do it today? No, you don't answer that. <laughs> the person next to you is going, you did. You did actually, twice. No, I'm keeping a little book here. But, but, and here's what Romans, in, in, in this letter that the Apostle Paul, leader in the early church, wrote to the, uh, a church in the city of Rome. So it's called the Book of Romans. In chapter 3, verse 23, here's what he wrote. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, of God's standard. Every human being. And, and then, in Romans 6, 23, it says this. The wages or the consequences of sin is death. We've all sinned, and it's terminal. Now, all of us have walked with, with a friend or a family member or maybe personally have walked through facing cancer. There's so many people that battle with cancer. Or, you know, it doesn't, you know, that's something that no one can just say that's never touched me or nobody I know or nobody I care about or nobody in my family. I'm walking through with a, with a friend of mine who's going through cancer right now. And, and if, if, if somebody came and said, you have cancer, 
And, and, and suppose you respond this way. You say, well, you know, I don't like it. I don't like your diagnosis. Well, does whether or not I like someone's diagnosis change the reality? No. If, if a doctor looks and says, you have cancer, and I say, I don't like it, it doesn't change the reality. What if I said, I don't believe it. I refuse to believe it. Does that change the diagnosis? Does that change the reality? No. What if I said, I'm going to ignore it? Does that make it go away? No, it actually makes it worse because I'm ignoring something that's life-threatening. And so this friend of mine has basically, his attitude has been, I need to find the people who have the best chance of getting me cured. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the right response. When you get the bad news of cancer is, I need to find the best possibility of getting cured. And what we're going to talk about today is how God looks and says, you may have a sickness in your soul called sin. And that sickness may, it may be terminal. And that sickness is actually genetic. It's passed on through the, the human family. And that, that sickness is also behavioral. We also, we exacerbate it and make it worse because we think things and say things and do things we shouldn't do. And we don't do the good things we should do. And we add to it. And, and so what we have to acknowledge is that although there is a sickness... God, by grace, has made a way. God has made a way. God, God has a cure for the sickness of our soul, for the cancer of sin. And that cure can be understood in one word, Jesus. He is the cure for the sickness and the cancer of sin that ravages our souls and our lives and our families and all that we are. I love this passage in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It just shows the heart of God. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Now listen to this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God does not desire anyone to be taken out by this terminal sickness of sin that ravages our souls. He desires that none would perish but all would come to eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the heart of the God we gather to worship. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is teaching. And it's interesting to me that sometimes people will say, well, I know the Bible talks about you know, heaven, and that's great. And I know the Bible talks about hell, and I don't like that. But, you know, but Jesus, was gent you know, Jesus was gentle. Jesus always kind, never dealt with tough things. If you, if you tell yourself that, you haven't really read the Bible and seen the things Jesus says, because sometimes Jesus speaks the truth in a way that's very piercing. And in Matthew 25, he's talking about eternity. And he says, people, human beings are kind of, it's going to kind of like be sheep and goats with a shepherd, where the shepherd will separate the sheep and, sheep and goat, but this is going to be people. And, and at the, in the midst of all of this, in Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says this, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus says, some will be separate from God, and some will be brought into the arms of God. And the difference is this one word, this one name, Jesus. Have people found the cure? The, the, the one cure for sin and the sickness of our soul is found in Jesus Christ. And so I want to think together about what does the Bible say about heaven? We're going to talk about heaven, then we're going to talk about hell, and then we're going to talk about Jesus and how he gives a way to enter a relationship with the Father through faith in him. And, and as I talk about heaven, we could do a, like a, a 20 or 30 or 40 week series on, on these topics. And so I'm gonna just try to give you a composite sketch, just a picture of what the Bible says about heaven. And if you, we, we have notes that are on our website. You can download those notes and there'll be a bunch of passages and things you can look at there. But what does the Bible say about heaven? First, overall, the general report is a good report. Just so you all know, if you didn't know. Good report on heaven, all right? It, the Bible says it's life beyond this life. When this life ends, if you know God through faith in Jesus and heaven is your home, if this life ends, it doesn't end. You begin a new life, an eternal life. The Bible gives a picture of a celebration, a picture of this celebration, this party, this rejoicing. That's a picture of heaven. The Bible talks about worship and praise, that when you're in the presence of a glorious God, you want to worship that God. So there's worship, there's praise. The Bible gives a picture of a new Jerusalem, and if, you don't, if you're not around church much and don't know what that means in, in, in our present world, that may not make sense, but in the ancient world, you know, Jerusalem was this place of safety and security and God's presence and community and the sense of hopefulness. Heaven is God's dwelling place. And to dwell in heaven, and here's the key, is to dwell with God, to be near to God, to draw near him and his presence. 
The biblical picture of heaven is that we're with others who believe in Jesus. We have perfect community with all those who have loved and followed Jesus through all of time. It's an amazing, staggering, glorious picture. And understand that the biblical picture of heaven is, is, is more real than this earth. When, people, when I have Christians say to me, they'll say, hey, you know, do you think we'll recognize each other in heaven? I'm like, absolutely. Ab- without question. It's Eastern mysticism that says we become these disembodied, hazy you know, spirits or we cease to exist. That's, but, but Christian belief is that, is that we become more of who we are and we will, we will live fully forever with God in community with each other. The Bible gives a picture of a restored Eden, of paradise, a new heaven, a new earth. The Bible gives a picture where, where all things are made new. All of the things that are broken and wearing out and falling apart, including our bodies, <laughs> Everything's made new. That's the picture of heaven. It's beauty beyond description. The Bible talks about rivers and trees and animals that get along with each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. I got some amens there, okay? Uh, but the Bible gives a picture of, of riches beyond comprehension. And our sense of riches in this life is so limited. But it's this, this sense of, the, the, and I think this is the picture the Bible's trying to give us about heaven is that it's more glorious and wonderful than we can comprehend. And what we think is the best now will be like nothing then because it'll be so much better. I, I heard this joke years ago, and I, now I'm not doing theology, now I'm telling a joke. So don't worry, if you don't agree with my theology, it's a joke, relax. So, so I heard this joke years ago, and I thought it was really very telling. It's about this guy who passes away, and he, he prays to God. He says, God, listen, I'm going to heaven. I have worked my whole life. I've made so much. Can I just bring just two suitcases of whatever I want to bring. Can I just bring some of my stuff? And God says, sure, bring, now again, this is a joke, okay? So God says, sure, bring a couple suitcases. So don't get excited about this because you don't get to do that. But so so the, this guy cashes in everything he has, puts it all into gold, and packs these two suitcases so he can barely lift them. He drags these two suitcases of gold into heaven. And an angel greets him and says, what do you got in the suitcases? Most people don't come with suitcases. What do you got? And the guy says, check this out. He opens the one and flops on just glimmering gold. Opens the second one, lays it open. And the angel says, you brought pavement? <laughs> right. Perspective, right? Um, what, what we think is so valuable is going to be gravel compared to how glorious it will be. The Bible says that heaven will be our Sabbath rest. It's holistic. All that we are will finally be at rest. Our striving and our struggling and our anxieties, there'll be peace and rest. The Bible says it will be glory because we'll be in the presence of the glorious God. The Bible says that heaven is God's gift through Jesus. He offers it as a gift through Jesus. The Bible is called our eternal inheritance. And the thing about inheritance inheritance is you didn't earn it. It was given to you by someone else. And heaven is an eternal inheritance. And heaven is the home we've always longed for. And the Bible doesn't talk about heaven as a house. It talks about it as a home. What our hearts long for is not a house. There's people who can live in a nice house and they don't feel at home. It's being home with God and home with each other. God's picture biblically of heaven is so extraordinary. But, but here's what I want to say to you about heaven. All the language that the Bible tries to use to describe it, it falls short. It's God's best pictures for our limited abilities to understand, but it will be so far and beyond that. It will be so glorious. And and so, of course, this is a favorite topic of people, and and it should be because it's something so glorious beyond our comprehension, but we get glimpses and we're amazed and our hearts long to be with God and to be with each other and to be at peace, to be at rest. Listen to what John 14, one through three says. Jesus is talking, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, You believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. Uh, If that were so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. The key is not so much a room in a mansion. That's not the point. The point is Jesus says, you will be with me and I will be with you. It's community, it's fellowship. In Revelation chapter 21, right near the end of the Bible, we read this. Then I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth. This is a picture of glory. This is the picture of heaven. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And in the ancient world, that sea was a place of turmoil and fear and storms. And the point is, that'll all be gone. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. What a picture. What a spiritual reality that we can and should hold on to if we know God through faith in Jesus Christ. But this isn't the only picture that God paints for us. He says there are those who will reject Jesus and not follow Jesus. He says they will be separate. So here's, here's what the Bible says about hell. And there's lots of passages about this in the Bible as well. And as an overview to understand, it's not good news. The picture, the picture is harsh. The picture is bad. Here's some of the imagery that the Bible uses. It's a furnace, and not in a good way. It's eternal punishment. It's outer darkness. All that is good and light and beautiful, it's outside of where the light is. It's a place of weeping and torment. And this next thing I think is probably the most important. It's separation from God. All those things are bound together because it's a place where God is not. And if you take away the goodness and the beauty and the hope of God, all you have left is darkness. It's removal from God's glory and power. The Bible calls it a bottomless pit, a lake of fire, the second death, a place for the devil and his demons. It's where sin is unrestrained. It's the absence of all that is good. It's where purity and holiness are gone and goodness ceases to exist. It's a place of judgment. It's serious. Revelation 20, 14, and 15 says this. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. In John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, there's this passage that, actually, John 3, 16 is probably the most well-known verse in the whole Bible. It's the verse that people will hold in the end zone of a football game, hoping to get on a camera so people can see John 3, 16. They never put John 3, 18 on there. It's just, I want you to listen to John 3, 16 and 17 and 18 and get the full picture. John 3, 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Man, that's great. That's good news. Praise the Lord for that. Here's verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But he's saving us from something. He's saving us from sin and spiritual cancer and from death and from judgment. But verse 18 brings it all together. Whoever believes in him in Jesus is not condemned. This is why people don't hold up a poster that says John 3, 18. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This, this, the Bible teaches that God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, but it also teaches that those who don't believe in him are condemned already. What it's saying is that every human being has this, this, this sickness of sin in our souls. And it drives a wedge between us and God and it separates us from God. And yet God says, I desire that none would perish and all would come to a knowledge of salvation. That's the heart of God. That, that's the longing of God. And God wants us to, to know him and to follow him. And so he has made a way. And he has opened the door. In John 14, verse 5, we see Jesus interacting with Thomas, one of his disciples. And, and Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? How do we get there? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. But no one comes to the Father except through me. 
He opens a way. He makes a way for all who will believe and all who will receive him. And so I want to talk about the amazing, loving, seeking heart of God. We, we, we can't find our way to God no matter how hard we try, but we don't have to. You know why? God came looking for you. You know, we, we sung that song about reckless love that leaves the 99. He came looking. He came searching for you and for me. That is the heart of God. Look with me at Luke chapter 15, verses three through seven. Jesus tells a story. It's one of three stories. And anytime in the Bible you see clusters of three, you know it's trying to make an absolute final emphasis of a truth. In the ancient world, if you said, wanted to emphasize something, you would say it three times. So if you want to say that God is the holiest you can be, then you would say this, holy, 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 three times. Four times, over the top. You don't do that. It's just holy, holy, holy. And so in Luke 15, there's three stories back to back to back. And they're all saying the same thing. What it's saying is, Jesus is saying, I want to make this point as strongly as this point can be made. And the first story is about a woman who has 10 coins and loses one, and she searches like crazy to find that one coin, and when she finds it, she celebrates. And the third story is about a father who has two sons, and one wanders off, but that father watches the horizon and longs for his son to come home. And when his son finally comes home, he embraces him and loves him, and he says, my son was lost, and he's found. He was gone, and he's home again. These are stories about something that was lost that God longs to see found. And what it's talking about is you and me. This is the heart of God. He's searching and seeking the lost one. So in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse three, Jesus tells the second of these three stories. And Jesus told them this parable, this story. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. This is the heart of God. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. I love that picture because that's what God did for me when I was 16 years old. He found me and he put me on his shoulders and he brought me home. He puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. What Jesus is not saying is there's people so good they don't need him. His point is this. The heart of God longs for and searches and seeks. And he's made a way. And although everyone in the human family is contaminated with this, this, this spiritual cancer of sin that condemns us and separates us from God, and it's terminal, and it's generational, and it's real, but God says, I have made a way. So what is the way to heaven? How do we find our way back home again? In John 11, beginning in verse 25, we read this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live <coughs> even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He makes a way through himself. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 11, we read these words. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There is a way to heaven. There is a cure for the, for the spiritual sickness that has touched every human being who's walked this planet except for Jesus. He could care, carry our sin and our shame and take our sickness because he was pure and holy and healthy and he took all of ours on himself so we wouldn't have to take it. That's the good news of Jesus. So how should I respond? How do you respond to this? 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says this, and this is powerful. Listen to these words. If we claim to be without sin, I've never thought a bad thought, never said a bad thing, never done a wrong thing. I do every, every good opportunity, jump right into it. That's me. You know, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. See, if we say I've never sinned, we say, God, you're a liar, because God says, no, you're tainted with sin, you're covered with sin, and it's a problem. 
you have that, you know, my, God's diagnosis is you have sin. And if we say we don't have it, we say, God, you're lying. But it doesn't change the spiritual reality. In John 15, five to eight, we read these words, and Jesus is speaking. And he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus says, I've made a way. I've made a way for eternity, for all who will believe. And everyone's invited and everyone's welcomed. But he doesn't just grab people and drag them in. He invites so I'm gonna, in a moment, go to prayer. And I wanna let you know, I'm gonna actually invite everyone here to respond in some way. So I'm gonna tell you in advance how I'm gonna pray so you know if you wanna respond. You can begin to think and, and pray about it. First, if you come to a place where you said yes to Jesus, you know you came to the cross, you received Jesus Christ, you said, be my leader, be the one who forgives me, take away all my sin, this, the sickness of my soul, heal me, Jesus, and, and I give my life to you. If you've done that, I'm going to give you a chance to raise your hand and say, I have made that commitment. I have followed Jesus. And I'm going to pray with you, just thanking him for all he's done and praying for his power in your life. Second group of people I'm going to pray with this morning is if you say, I have never received Jesus. Or I, I don't know, I'm not sure. But today, I want to receive Jesus. And I want to pray and say, Jesus, heal my soul and wash me clean and bring me into a relationship with you. And you want to make that commitment today. I want to pray with you. And then third, if you say, I'm not a Christian, and I'm not ready to become a Christian, but I want to know more about this. I mean, I'm here, I'm listening. If it's true, I want to know more, but I'm just not there yet. I want to, I want to pray for you, that you would keep coming here if you live out of the area to another church, and, and that you open the Bible and you begin to learn. So I'm going to ask you to not just kind of listen to me pray, I'm going to ask you to pray with me in your hearts. Oh, Jesus, we come before you today amazed that you seek after the one lost sheep. And everyone in this room was either that lost sheep that you found or we're still wandering. And we may not even know it. And so we come before you and we think about eternity and the glory of heaven and that you've made a way there and the reality of hell and that, that nobody wants to, to be there. And Jesus, you've made a way for all who will receive you by faith. And I'm going to ask you right now, just keeping your heart in a place of prayer, if you have, for me it was when I was 16 years old, for my wife Sherry, it was when she was five, but, but if you had a point where you know you came to Jesus, you accepted him, you have put your faith in him, you are a Christian and you believe in Jesus, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can and raise it like you mean it, all right? And keep your hand up, keep your head high in the air. Lord Jesus, for those of us that, that are raising our hand right now, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross that he died for our sins. He took our shame. He healed our brokenness. He gave us hope and life and meaning and purpose. And heaven is our home. We thank you. We praise you. We rejoice in the supernatural spiritual reality. And fill us with your spirit so we can live for you and hold your hand tight every day of our life, walking close with Jesus until one day we see him face to face. Okay, go ahead and put your hands down and just keep, that, just keep that prayer in your heart. Now, if you're here today in the worship center, if you're in the family worship venue, and you say, I've never received Jesus. I'm not, sure, I'm not positive that I have, but I want to right now, I get, I get the message. I want to know Jesus. I want to receive his death on the cross, his resurrection. He paid the price. He took my sickness, my shame. He, he, he wants to offer me healing. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand high right now and just say, and I'm going to pray for you. So raise your hand high and say, I want to pray that right now. And as you raise your hand, I want you to actually, for those of you that are raising your hand, raise your hand and look up at me. Look at me real quick. So I can say, I'm, just, I'm going to pray for you right there, okay? And so you can keep your hand up there. And right here in the balcony over here, good. And right here on this side, over here, all the way in the corner there, good. Is there anybody else? Okay, up here in the balcony on the right-hand side, yeah, right there in the corner, good. I'm not going to go a long time, but if this is where you're at, you say, I want to know Jesus, just raise your hand. Okay, right there, okay, right there in the, okay, right there, I see you. Okay, beautiful. And now keep, if you raise your hand right now, just keep it in the air and keep it high as I pray for you. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for those with their hands lifted up and, and they're, just, they're saying, until now I didn't fully understand what Jesus did for me, but Jesus, I need you. 
and I put my faith in you and I believe in you. I believe you came to this world and you died on the cross for my sins and you were the only one that wasn't struck with the sin sickness but you took my sickness on yourself. I thank you, Jesus. I confess my wrongs, my sin. I need you to cleanse me and I accept you this day. I accept you this day. And I want to say if you're in the family worship venue and your hand is up in the air right now, look up at Pastor Keith because he's standing in the front. He wants to look at you and he's, he's joining in prayer right now and you're going to talk to him after the service. But Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross and rose again. I accept you. I believe in you. And if you're online right now, and we always have over 100 people watching online, and if you've got your hand in the air right now, would you send a note in right now and Pastor Nate Tibbs is going to respond to you right now and interact with you as well. Okay, you can put your hands down. Thank you. And then finally, if you're here and you say, I've never received Jesus, and I'm starting to get the idea here, I'm curious, but I'm not ready to make that commitment. But, but I do want you to pray and say, God, if you're real, I do want to know you. I want to learn more. If that's you, just raise your hand. And just say, hey, you know, raise your hand high and say, God, I'm, I'm not ready today. Okay, good, thanks. And you know what, this is a great, this is the place where it's safe for that, man. We, we're journeying and learning. That's great. I see a number of hands lift up. That's, thank you. And just, I want to pray, Lord, for those with their hands up right now. Lord, I was there for, I was there, and I had family members there for decades before they came to know you, Jesus. I pray for those with their hands up right now. They're just saying, God, I don't know if this is real. I don't know that the whole Jesus thing is true, but, but if it is, I want to know, and my heart's open, so lead me and guide me. And God, I pray for these folks that you'll show yourself to them, and you'll open their hearts, and you'll reveal yourself. Go ahead and put your hands down. And now, for all of us, Lord Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you for the hope of heaven that is a certain hope because of what Jesus has done. And God, thank you that in your word, you say that if one person, one lost sheep comes home, one coin is found, one child comes back, to, if one person comes to Jesus, you tell us the angels of heaven rejoice. And this morning, between this earlier service and this service, almost 20 people have said yes to Jesus. We rejoice. Can someone say amen? amen. We rejoice, Jesus. We praise you. We celebrate Jesus. And we pray for those that have made that first time commitment. And before I close our prayer, I want to ask you, if you made that commitment for the first time in the family worship venue, will you walk right up to Pastor Keith? If you're in the worship center, right when the service is done, rock right up to me. And we, what I want you, when you come to me, give me a handshake, a high five, or a hug. Your call. One of the three H's there. Come up to me and just, and just say, I just prayed today. And we want to have a prayer with you and celebrate. And we want to give you a Bible and a 50-day reading plan to help you along. And if you, if you didn't pray that prayer, but you're curious about this, go by the Connection Center and just say, can, can I get one of those Bibles and 50-day reading plans? And then dig into the Bible. Start doing some research. Start learning more and more. Keep coming back because you're welcome. We love you right where you're at. And we long that you would come to know the love of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, as you send us from here, send us with joy because you have made a way. And when the sickness of sin had, had spread across the planet, you said, I have a way home. His name is Jesus. For that, we give you praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. And I want to invite you forward for prayer on the sides. And if you raise your hand on that second prayer to receive Jesus, come up, give, give me three or four minutes. Come on right up here and join me. And if you're new, go by the Connection Center and tell them you're new and they want to give you a gift. God bless you. Walk in his joy. Amen? amen. Have a great week.